Good evening and welcome to Fountain Street Church. I am the Reverend Mariela Perez Simons and I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to our virtual service tonight. Bienvenidos, welcome. For decades, some of you have been coming to this beautiful church, to this sacred building on a night like tonight. And I grieve for you. I grieve with you. I grieve that we cannot be here together tonight. What a year it has been, beloveds. What a year. 2020 will likely be remembered for many years to come for the disruption it has caused upon the entire world, for the pain it has inflicted, for the losses we have had to bear in terms of human lives. This is a year where we have been asked to embrace stillness, especially now around the holidays. And I find fascinating how even the stars, the planets have aligned in stillness. In our night sky, two of the largest planets in our solar system have come together in a great conjunction, creating what is known as the Christmas star, the Christmas star. This vibrant planetary conjunction, which humans have not seen in nearly 800 years, is happening now in 2020 and seems to be pointing us towards stillness, stillness. Stillness like peace sounds easy, but it's not. Stillness can feel like a labor, something we have to work on. As my colleague, the Reverend Teresa Ines Soto puts it in their poem, The Labor of Stillness. They say, every speck of the universe, Every speck of the universe, stars, planets, gas clouds, dust grains, black holes, dark matter, everything is in motion. But there is an ancient story for this season. There is an ancient story for this season about a star, a star that stood still, which is to say that faster is not always better that sometimes holding still, just holding, like a manger holds hay or babies, is the point. You are the star, part dust, part fire, part light, resting against the plush depth of darkness. You, you are the marker of good news unfolding all around you. And yet, yet, it is still true that having to wait for something is not the same as having it. The light became still over the place where the story of liberation began to shine. We can light the way and leave room for the liberation that will be born from the labor of our stillness. We can light the way and leave room for the liberation that will be born from the labor of stillness. Let us light the way. Let us worship together.
this evening as we gather in the stillness of our homes and we hold the light of Christmas within our hearts and across our community. We prepare ourselves the space to illuminate our candle of peace, the final candle to be lit in this season of Advent. In late November, we started the Advent season by illuminating a single candle, the candle of faith recognizing that faith is made by and made for hard times, and it is a light in the darkness of despair. Next, we illuminated the candle of hope, honoring that hope will hold us in our doubts and call us forward into tomorrow. And we celebrated that the light of hope, even in the darkest of nights, illuminated the fear of uncertainties. And then together we illuminated the candle of love, knowing that love is more than romance novels and cheesy Valentine's Day cards. Love is fierce and strong and a powerful force in our world. And it is a light that draws even our spread out community together in these remarkable times of physical distance. And just this past week, we illuminated the candle of joy and we held on to the belief that it is necessary to cultivate joy, especially in these hard times. And we celebrated that joy can be a light that every one of us can share freely without diminishing our own light. Which brings us to this evening. In the stillness of this holy and mysterious night, we gather as friends and family and strangers and the unknown, and we bring the light of Advent to the candle of peace. And it is with the very spirit of faith, hope, love, and joy that we light this candle as our prayer and our intention to know and experience peace as stillness. Blessed be the gift of peace. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph went from the town of Nazareth to the city of David called Bethlehem to be registered with Mary. 
While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now in that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And then suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them.
a minute ago, Reverend Matthew shared a reading with us, a reading from the Bible. But really, it was a story. And I'd like to walk through that story again with you, but I'd like to talk to some of you in particular, maybe those of you who aren't old enough to drive a car. Hey kids, are you there? You might have zoned out a little, I totally get it, but can you come back in for a minute? Can you listen? I wanna tell you the Christmas story. Okay, maybe you are one of those kids who has heard the Christmas story a zillion, million, zillion times, and you're tired of hearing it. Sorry. Or maybe you could tell the story better than I could, and it's your favorite time of year. Here, let's tell it again. Or maybe you've never heard it before. In which case, let me tell you. This is the Christmas story. We don't know all of the pieces of the Christmas story. We know what's been recorded and passed down verbally. Because here's the thing about history. History and storytelling mingle together and we lose things and gain things into the story along the way. But even after all this time, it's a good story and it has some good lessons to share. After all this time, because this story is 2,000 years old, 2,000 years old, and it's about a kid. Yeah, did you know there were kids 2,000 years ago? Kids like you. <laughs> all right, to be honest, the Christmas story is actually about a baby, which is a really little kid, but still. So the Christmas story is the story of Jesus being born. Jesus is the name of this baby. And Jesus has a family. Jesus' family is made up of a mom and a dad, Mary and Joseph. And a lot of the Christmas story actually happens before Jesus is born, happens about Mary and Joseph. Because your parents actually had a life before you, did you know? <laughs> So Mary and Joseph, they are excited about the arrival of their baby. They're excited that they're going to have a family, but they're also nervous and scared because, well, they don't have a picture perfect home to bring Jesus back to. They actually, at the time that Jesus is about to be born, they're traveling. They're walking and riding miles and miles because at the time that they're alive, it was how they did a census, like we did this year in 2020. But they also had a not so nice government and it made things hard. So they were walking and riding on a donkey. Have you ever ridden on a donkey? Okay, how about a horse? Well, a donkey is smaller and a little bumpier. <laughs> So imagine riding on a donkey for miles and miles and miles and then also having a big baby in your belly. I don't think it would be very fun, but that's what they had to do. So they're traveling and traveling and they come to this town called Bethlehem. And when they get to Bethlehem, Mary knows that it's time for Jesus to be born. And so they find a place to stay but there's no nice places left. Nobody can give them a nice hotel room or an Airbnb to rent out for the night. Instead, they end up in a manger. Manger is kind of like a stable or a barn or a garage, but mostly it's just nothing pretty. It's really simple. There were no fancy decorations, no extra pillows or extra blankets, but it had what they needed. It had light and warmth and each other. And so they settled into their manger because that baby Jesus in Mary's belly was telling them what he needed to come into the world. He needed peace and quiet and calm. And so they settled in for a long night. But they weren't the only ones who got quiet and calm about Jesus' arrival. See, there were these shepherds out in the nearby fields. And shepherds are farmers who have sheep and goats. 
And they had heard all this commotion in town about the baby that was coming. And all, we all had to get ready for the baby. And then they heard the gossip train quiet down a little as the baby was about to arrive. And there was really nothing left for anyone else to do but to sit and wait and take some deep breaths. <sighs> Especially Mary. So they sat and they waited patiently and were ready, ready for the arrival of that exciting new kid. They weren't the only ones who were ready. There were also the wise ones, these wise people. Think scholars, teachers, scientists, professors. They had been paying attention and they knew that the birth of a child would change Mary and Joseph's lives forever. But they also knew that a new child changes more than just their family's lives. They change the lives of everyone they touch as they learn and they grow in the world. And they knew Jesus was going to change a lot of lives. So they came to say hello and welcome to Jesus. They came to say congratulations to Mary and Joseph. And they brought with them gifts. Now remember, it was 2,000 years ago, not 2020. So they didn't have to leave the gifts out on the front porch and then somebody else came and got them later. They got to bring them in and say hi. But they did bring a different warning. Remember that mean government I mentioned earlier? It wasn't safe to travel. And so they told Mary and Joseph to just stay, to stay in their makeshift home for a while longer to stay peaceful and calm. And they themselves didn't travel in the way that they normally would. They didn't make a big fuss about it or go in a big group. They went quietly and calmly and following the twinkling stars in the sky, they went by a different path than normal. Hmm. So on that first Christmas, some 2,000 years ago, lots was quiet. Everyone was quiet and calm and at peace. I don't know about you, but I think it's kind of interesting in 2020 that the first Christmas, the first kid to celebrate Christmas, Jesus, celebrated it with just his family just his family in a quiet, simple manger. So this year, for your Christmas in 2020, I know that you might not be traveling to see friends or family or having people over for exciting parties or to bake cookies, and that can be sad and frustrating, and that's okay. But I wanted to remind you about the first Christmas that first Christmas and that first Christmas kid who celebrated Christmas with just his mom and dad, with just his family. So if that's what your Christmas looks like this year, if your Christmas is just you and your family at home, taking some deep breaths and watching the twinkling stars in the sky, well, that is a merry and peaceful Christmas indeed. So Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to your family. May it be filled with peace and under the light of the beautiful Christmas star. Thanks for listening.
before the birth of the Messiah, there have been various prophecies foretelling his birth. We find them in the Hebrew scriptures through prophets such as Isaiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Peace, Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace. What a fascinating life that child will live. Such a short life, but what a life. I was recently reading the book of John, which main purpose back then was to make the case that Jesus was in fact the Messiah of those prophecies, the Son of God, which is to say the human embodiment of God. And reading this book through fresh eyes recently, I was so moved by Jesus' embodiment of God, how his ideas and his words and his actions reveal the nature of God until the very end, when he washed the feet of his students and delivered his final teachings to them, including love one another as I have loved you, as I have loved you, by which he meant in this way, love others in this way. It was these acts of loving generosity that would become the hallmark of early Christians that would show the world who Jesus was and what God was like in human form. Part of his final message to them and to us was this, peace I live with you, my peace I give you, the peace I give is not one that the world can give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Peace, inner peace, peace of mind, peace of heart. Because Jesus was a teacher of the outer world and also of the inner world. Jesus advocated for rolling our sleeves up and doing the work of love in the world. And he also believed in tending the inner world, for he was someone who spent much time in prayer, in meditation, and in the wilderness, connecting with something larger than himself. He found peace in those practices. He found within what cannot be found without. And that side of Jesus is something I think we need to learn from this year in the midst of so much turmoil, with the current mental health crisis we are facing, and with all the conflicts in our world. How can we find peace in the midst of all of that? But what is peace, actually? Can we unpack that word? Because just like with the concept of love, many of us don't have a clear understanding of what peace is. As Maxine Hong Kingston puts it, the images of peace are ephemeral. The language of peace is subtle. The reasons for peace, the definitions of peace, the very idea of peace have to be invented and invented again." End of quote. So what is peace? Peace, pass, shalom, salam, shanti something almost every religious tradition promotes. Peace is a concept of harmony that refers to the absence of conflict inside individuals and between individuals and groups and nations. The Anglo-French term PES comes from the Latin Pax, which means agreement or treaty of peace. The Hebrew word for peace, shalom, according to Jewish theology, comes from a verb that means wholeness or to be complete. And the Arabic term salam, in addition to peace, has multiple meanings, including justice, equity, and well-being. In many languages and traditions, the word for peace is also used as a greeting or a farewell 
peace, paz, shalom, salam, shanti. The symbol for peace for many of these traditions is the dove, usually a white dove. The color white is also a symbol of peace. We find images of white doves in ancient scriptures and artwork in paganism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Peace, like the proverb says, is the highest happiness. And in our culture, I believe peace is underrated, underrated in my opinion. We chase after happiness all the time, but peace, hmm. yeah, peace is, is underrated because perhaps it feels like something impossible, something nice, but impossible. Hard to attain in a culture where so many different things are pulling us in so many different directions all the time. But the peace that Jesus was talking about is not a peace that can be found in the world. It is something we cultivate. It is a peace that we can come home to. Like love, peace is not just a feeling, it is a practice. And like I said in my sermon about love, we have not been educated properly on how to cultivate peace. We have not been given the tools, the practices, the proper education on how to cultivate both inner peace and interpersonal peace. Let me ask you, how far away from peace are you tonight? If conflict, is here, inner conflict and interpersonal conflict, and peace is here, where are you along that line? When was the last time you felt like all is calm, all is bright? When was the last time you slept in heavenly peace? When was the last time you said, it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul? To understand peace, we need to understand conflict because again, as I mentioned, there is a line and on this side is conflict and on this side is peace and we must learn how to travel that distance from here to here, from conflict to peace. Conflict often arises from our differences of opinions and perspectives when two or more people can agree on something usually because of contradicting values and opinions. Many of the conflicts we face in the world today come from our lack of acceptance of different perspectives, from the idea that there is one right way, and that is, of course, our way. Peace comes when we re reframe our psyches to accept that there are many ways of doing things, many ways of being in this world when we loosen our firm grip on our positions. And I'm not just talking about the big conflicts, differences between cultures and religions, but the small ones too. Like the difference between the way you load the dishwasher and the way your partner loads the dishwasher. Or the difference between how we hang toilet paper. There is a battle on the internet happening right now on what is the proper way to hang toilet paper. And Baby Yoda is winning the internet. According to Grogu, this is the way, and this is not the way. Seriously though, I'm talking about the differences we encounter in the day to day between different generations, between family members, between team members. To manage conflict, we need to be more understanding of the people around us, since conflict often arises from simple misunderstandings. Misunderstandings. So it's important for us to work on understanding others as well as understanding ourselves. For example, here at Fountain Street Church, our staff is learning our personality types, from our Myers-Briggs types to our Enneagram types to our Harry Potter houses because the more we understand one another, the less misunderstandings we will have. Conflict also occurs within ourselves. 
when we are not living in alignment with our values, when our outer life is out of alignment with our inner lives. Peace comes when we find our place in the world, when we live a life of integrity. And also when we decide not to go to war with ourselves, when we look within with kindness and compassion and understanding. Poor communication skills and lack of emotional intelligence also play a role in our conflicts. That's why we are exploring how we can teach those concepts in our religious education here at Fountain Street Church. So as we travel this road from conflict to peace, we also need diplomacy skills, which is knowing what to say, how to say it, and when to say it. Diplomacy is not touch, taught much in our society. And if we want peace, we need to learn diplomacy and conflict management skills. Peace also comes when we drop our defenses down because so often we come to our conversations fully armed. We come with clenched fists and tight muscles. But peace only comes when we soften up that rigidity and listen to the other person's perspective. Peace comes in that softening. Peace feels light. There is a lightness to peace, right? Versus conflict, it feels much heavier, much heavier. So peace is when we let our hearts be light. When we let, our, let go of our rigidity, physically and metaphorically, our rigidity. And peace also comes when we realize how small and insignificant sometimes those rigid positions can be. I like to do this bird eye view exercise where I pull my awareness from inside my head and I move up as if I can see my house and then the city and then the state and then the country and then the planet and then the solar system and then the galaxy. And that humbles me. Every time I do that, I feel so small. And I tell myself, if the earth is a speck of dust spinning around in an infinite universe, then this little conflict in my mind is not that important. I have a copy of this cartoon in my office because it reminds me of this concept. It is a cartoon of a mother and a child. And the mother tells the child, the universe doesn't revolve around you. And the child, embarrassed, says, I know. And at the bottom it says, young Galileo. Like young Galileo, we know that the universe doesn't revolve around us. But goodness, from here, from our perspective, it sure feels that way. Some things from here look so clear. How could I possibly be wrong? And yet, sometimes we forget that our understanding of reality is just that, our understanding, our perspective. And so this is a practice of peace, seeing our opinions and our positions as one perspective. Look, there are things that are worth giving my peace for. There are things that I will never stop fighting for. These are things such as human rights, for instance. For the, but for the most part, the conflicts of our lives are small. There are often just differences of opinions and misunderstandings, but they can cause tremendous havoc in our inner lives and in our, our outer lives. They can be small, but they are often all-consuming, draining us of our energy and keeping us from the bigger issues that need our attention and our energy. In letting go of the little things, we find peace. Peace also comes when we accept the ever-changing nature of life, the ever-changing nature of life, because, oh, how we go to war with life herself. Do you ever have arguments with life? Have you ever said to life, I am so mad at you, how could you? If you haven't yet, it's probably because life hasn't taken away from you something precious, and she will. 
there's this amazing TED Talk but by Nora McInerney, who lost her husband, her father, and a pregnancy at the age of 31. And she says that in the midst of her grief, people would say to her, I can't even imagine. And she would think something along the lines of, you better try to imagine grief because grief is going to happen to you sooner or later because loss is part of life. And we need to talk about it and accept it in order to find peace. She has a good podcast called Terrible, Thanks for Asking, referring to the kind of honesty that we need in order to have open discussions about the reality of loss, which we don't talk about enough, which we bear in silence too often. The sooner we accept the impermanence of life, the sooner we will find peace. The best interpretation I have found about life impermanence comes from Jennifer Wellwood in a poem titled, The Dakinis Speak. They say, my friends, let us grow up. Let's stop pretending we don't know the deal here. Or if we truly haven't noticed, let's wake up and notice. Look, everything that can be lost will be lost. Everything that can be lost will be lost. It is simple. How could we have missed it for so long? Let us grieve our losses fully like ripe human beings, but please let us not be so shocked by them. Let us not act so betrayed as though life had broken her secret promise to us. Impermanence is life only promised to us. And she keeps it with ruthless impeccability. To a child, life seems cruel, but she's only wild. And her compassion, exquisitely precise, brilliantly penetrating, luminous with truth. She strips away the unreal to show us the real. She strips away the unreal to show us the real. This is the true ride. Let us give ourselves to it. Let's stop making deals for a safe passage. There isn't one anyway, and the cost is too high. We are not children anymore. The true human adult gives everything for what cannot be lost. The true human adult gives everything for what cannot be lost. End of quote. What is she talking about? If everything can be lost, what is this thing that cannot be lost? And how do we give ourselves to it? Can we find peace there? If everything is impermanent, what is this permanent thing? If life strips away the unreal to show us the real, what is that exactly? I believe that is source. And I believe that many of our conflicts we have in our modern society come from our disconnection from that source. Because for the most part, the modern Western person is lost and disconnected to various degrees. Despite all of our material advance advances, and no matter how much prosperity the Western world gains externally, we are impoverished internally, spiritually. And this shows up in the heartbreaking numbers of anxiety, depression, suicide, substance abuse, etc., that we are facing today. I believe the underlying issue here is what I call the disconnect, our separation from source. And as a reminder, the root word for religion point us in that direction. Religare is a verb, and it means to reconnect or rebind. In other words, religion or spirituality is this act of reconnecting to source or rebinding our broken connection to the sacred, whatever you call it, God, goddess, life, universe, spirit, community, or creativity. We human beings have so many names for source, 
and we also have many practices that can lead us there where we can find peace. I like the image of the well to, refers, to refer to source. It's being overused, but I like it. Imagine that we all live in a village with these tiny little streets and all of them are leading to the well at the center of the village square. How far do you live from there? And what path do you take to get to the well? There are many paths. Which one is your path? And how often do you go to that well? Once a day? Five times a day? These paths represent our spiritual practices. Prayer, meditation, acts of service, yoga, chanting, creating art, building community. There are many paths to get to source. What matters is that we take a path or different path and that we go to the well often to cultivate peace there. One of the most traveled paths to the well is the path of breathing. Peace is every breath, says the Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. Peace is every breath. Every breath that heals us, every breath that releases stress, every breath that connects us to spirit. Peace is every breath that heals our nervous system so that we don't bring more conflict into the world. Peace is every breath that releases stress that keeps us from overreacting when faced, when faced with different opinions. Peace is every breath that connects us to spirit. Did you know that the Greek word for spirit, pneuma, means to breathe or blow? It has to do with wind. So pneuma is related to breath, and spirit is the breath of life, the breath of life. Yes, our breath is responsible for keeping us alive. And it's amazing to me how a simple inhale can have such a big responsibility to keep us alive. How a simple breath can bring oxygen to every cell in our bodies, which gives us energy to live. I like to picture the air. When I breathe in, I like to picture the air as white light. And I like to picture that light traveling inwards, reaching places of darkness that have never seen the light before. This is how we bring healing peace to those areas, those deep areas in our lives that are in need of light and peace. And when we hold our breath, we do the opposite. And we hold our breath all the time, like checking email, for instance. There is a term for that, email apnea, which was coined by researchers after noticing how four out of five people hold their breaths when checking emails. Again, we hold our breath throughout the day, all the time. We take approximately 20,000 breaths in one day. And that gives us so many opportunities, 20,000 opportunities to bring peace into our system. Every time we take a full breath, we reconnect to the spirit of life. Breathing intentionally is a really got a moment. It's a moment of sacred connection because the kingdom of heaven can be found here. The kingdom of heaven is here. This is not a peace that the world gives you. It is a peace found within. This is one of the ways we connect to the source of that which cannot be lost. May you find it, may it nourish you, may it shower you with heavenly peace. May it be so, may it be so. Thank you.
Friends, I invite you to take a moment to turn in silence towards that which you find most holy for meditation, for reflection, and for prayer. Most holy beloved, we feel you stirring within and among us this Christmas Eve. In our breath, sometimes ragged, sometimes even, sometimes shallow, sometimes deep. We feel you in our rest and our restlessness, in our racing minds and in the emptinesses. Most holy beloved, on this Christmas Eve, help us. Help us to make room in our lives and in the world for this story of the birth of revolutionary peace. Help us, help us to endure, even embrace darkness and mystery in these days and help us to be gracious, to be courageous and compassionate, to be supple and to be open to the change the many changes that are being called forth from us in this time. Challenge us, most holy beloved. Challenge us with the complexities of life and the world and remind us to breathe through it all. To stay, to stay in these frail and fragile bodies that are so resilient and yet we yearn, we yearn to escape them so much, to transcend them. Most holy beloved, lift up a mirror to us this Christmas Eve that we might see and know our lives and the whole of life more clearly. The patterns that we inhabit and the systems in which we participate. Lift up a microscope this Christmas Eve that we might see more closely the lines, the lines we hold, the lines we cross, and the tension and the toll that this takes on us and our world, body, mind, spirit. Most holy beloved in the in the spaces created this season by stories and song and scent and sound and sight. Give to us a God's eye view of this world that we inhabit and recreate. Give to us in this season the courage of those who still welcome new life into this broken world. 
who love life into being amidst risk and fear. Give to us the clumsiness of shepherds following stars. Challenge us, most holy beloved, to know within ourselves our own reluctance to accept the possibility of change and how changing the world might demand changes within us, within our families, our workplaces, our institutions, our hearts, our minds. Most holy beloved, birth in us this night peace and unrest. Awaken us with pains of labor. Startle us with the possibilities of revolution. Shout to us like angels announcing that we must move through fear and discomfort, through preference and plan into a new reality, a new promise that will disorient us. Most holy beloved, soften our stiffness. Renew us in the ways of faith and hope, of love and joy, tonight especially and always. Remind us of the promises of this season, of what can happen when we say yes to the promise of peace that will undo us. These things and the silent intentions of our hearts we offer in every holy and precious name. Shalom, salam, amen, and blessed be. The ancient Christmas stories are filled to the brim with good news. Whether it was angels visiting Elizabeth and Mary, or greetings of good news and great joy to the shepherds in their fields, or in the form of a star shining to the wise ones so far, far away. The Christmas tales are filled with invitations to hear the good news of faith, hope, love, joy, and peace for a world that so desperately needed to hear it when the angels first appeared. 
And today, thousands of years later from when these stories were first told and thousands of miles from where they first originated, Fountain Street Church here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, stands humbly and readily to deliver the same good news of faith, hope, love, joy, and peace today in our world that so desperately needs to hear it and experience it too. Such a task, such a calling, such a responsibility in our time does not happen alone and it does not happen in a vacuum. It requires a community that is invested, involved, and generous. And how blessed we are that we have a community that sees value in this and is invested in this good news. In the stillness of this nearly silent night, in the peace of the darkness that now surrounds us and in the warmth of the light that we have illuminated with one another this evening, I ask you to join us. I ask you to join the ancient angels as we use our gifts and our generosity to bring good news into our time and into our world. When we stand before you and invite you all and ourselves into this space of generosity at Fountain Street Church, we do so because we rely on your generosity and your support, specifically this year, to continue our 151-year ministry. And as many of you know, the offering plate, the physical offering plate that we often will pass is directly how we fully fund our social action and social grant programs beyond these cathedral walls of peace. And this year, we have not been able to pass those plates for over 10 months. And as a result, our ability to do this work, our ability to spread the good news of faith, hope, love, and joy has been compromised. And so I am asking you to join in with us in spreading the good news. I'm asking you to take a moment right now and offer what you can to our virtual offering plate. Whether it is through the text to give or through Venmo or simply sending a check as a Christmas gift to the office. With the spirit of the angels that brought the good news of great joy and with the spirit of our own church's embodiment of this Christmas story, we will now most humbly receive the offering. One of my favorite parts of the Christmas Eve service and celebration every year comes near the end as we light candles in the darkness and sing Silent Night. Mm -hmm. I love that moment when the ministers take the candles and they take the light from the peace candle and they pass it on. And then it goes to the choir and then slowly but surely it goes into the balcony and as it does so, light fills the space and it surrounds us in a warm embrace of peace in what feels like the climax of the Christmas Eve celebration. But we know we can't do that in person this year. 
And so Reverend Mariella and myself will be holding space with one another and with all of you who chose to join us in a Zoom immediately following this service. So grab a source of light from your own home and help us cultivate that light and create that embrace virtually with one another as we sing Silent Night and we gather for just a few moments immediately following this service. At this time in the service, I would like to send you off with a benediction, with a blessing. And this year, this song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, have been speaking to us. Because this song is asking us not to have a grand Christmas, but to have a merry little Christmas. Not to have a sad little Christmas, but a merry little Christmas. So here's our blessing to you. Here is our wish for you. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your hearts be light. Next year, all our troubles will be out of sight. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Make the Yuletide gay. Next year, all our troubles will be far away. Here we are, as in olden days, happy golden days of yore. Faithful friends who are dear to us will be near to us once more. Someday soon we all will be together, if the fates allow. So hang a shining star upon the highest bough and have yourself a merry little Christmas now. So hang a shining star upon the highest bough and have yourself a merry little Christmas now. Merry Christmas, beloved. We wish you peace. We love you.